Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'll be talking Tottenham with the brilliant Clive Tilsley, the legend. Clive was ITV senior football commentator for 22 years between 1998 and 2020, covering five World Cups and five Euro Championships, taking the microphone at 22 Champions League finals and 11 FA Cup finals. Royal TV Society Sports Commentator of the Year, 1998, 2000, 2002 and 2005. Voted Sony Radio Awards Sports Broadcaster of the Year in 1983. Currently working at CBS Sports, TalkSport, Amazon Prime Radio, Rangers TV, NBC Sports and ITV Sport. Clive, what a career. Welcome to the channel. Hope you're well. No, keep going, Chris. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> nobody, nobody else is, but I, I'd forgotten. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, it's just what it says is lucky boy. Um, the job that I always wanted to do. And um, I've got somewhere, um, certainly in the foothills, if not to the summit. Um, I'm still working. I'm still healthy. And I'm very, very happy. Clive, obviously, we're going to be talking about Tottenham today in England. And we're also going to be talking about your brand new book, Not For Me, Clive. Tell <laughs> us a little bit about the book, first of all. Well, I'm not sure what it is. So it's funny that just before publication, the... The publishers asked me how, how to describe it um, because it's not an autobiography, really, although it is semi-autobiographical. It's not a, a collection of yarns, although there are some yarns in it. Um, there are a lot of opinions uh, in there. Um, in the end, I think I came up with the phrase that it's a bit like having a conversation with me in which you don't get to say anything. I loved it. Very insightful. So I would recommend it to everybody. Um, now, you've come on here to talk about Tottenham. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the title of the book. Um, you, you say it is an Andy Townsend ism and an Ali Coist ism. Anyone else? Um, I, I think it's probably become a part of the football vernacular, which is kind of cute. Um, it's what I believe a football argument should be uh, when somebody states an opinion and somebody else says, not for me. We don't fight over it. Uh, we don't we don't fall out and never speak again over it. Um, you know, we're, we're, it, it's it is a sharing of opinions. And opinions are everything in, in, in football. Um, as you know, I mean, that, that's what you deal in on the podcast each and every week. Um, it's strange. I always feel that I am a genuine neutral. I was a Manchester United fan as a kid. I grew up in Bury. Um, my dad was a big United fan. He took me when I was five. I was home and away, sort of in my adolescence. And my first job was in Nottingham uh, in a local radio station. And when I went in there and started to cover Nottingham Forest home and away, and there were a mid-table championship side then under Brian Clough, but it was all still to happen. I was the same age as the players. So I was spending all my time with them. The players became my mates. And... I was commentating on my mates and that became bigger than anything that was happening at Old Trafford at the time. And to this day, who do I support? Um, I support my mates. Um, they, they tend to be managers rather than players now. I'm old enough to be the grandfather of most of the players um, that we drool over. Um, but if, if one of my mates changed his club um, and goes to manage somebody else, then my affection goes with him. So, you know, my Tottenham memories really are more around my my friends. I mean, Ray Clemens, one of the very closest friends I've ever had in the game. I miss him every day. Uh, Glenn Hoddle, obviously, has become a, a, a close friend over the course of the recent years, commentating together. You know, I've worked with the likes of David Pleat and Clive Allen, who would be in my phone and, and I would count as friends. And that, I say, my, my affection goes with them to wherever they go. Clive, you mentioned in the book that your first ever TV commentary was back in September 1989, Manchester City 5, Manchester United 1. What was your first ever Spurs game? Well, I did some radio um, before. I was working in local radio from uh, the late 70s, and I had a spell uh, on Merseyside for about 10 years during the halcyon uh, days of both Liverpool and then late, latterly Everton. I was at... The lane, the night, the night, the spring night in '85, when Neville Southall made that incredible save to break every Tottenham heart, because that was a, almost a title decider, even with seven or eight games to go. Um, it was such a crucial night, um, and again, at that time in my life, the, those guys were my pals, you know. And you, you did go out for a pint after the game, you know, back, back in the the pre-war era. Um, so they were social 
friends um and uh, and and you know my attachment to those memories really comes with watching watching my friends play so i remember commentating on a game at the lane when they were rebuilding the big stand and and the press box was in the corner um I, one of the few times I, i've had some pretty rubbish commentary positions in my in my time but that might have been the worst we, we were actually located in the corner of the stadium uh, back then but i remember coming to the lane as a united fan and you know without in any way uh, uh, trying to sort of eulogize over terrible times the walk back from to seven sisters was pretty hazardous back in you know back in the hooligan days it, you as an away fan you, you never wanted a long walk from the station to the stadium. You always wanted to get back to the public transport and get away. And, of course, um, uh, the tube station is what? I mean, it's a 15-minute walk, isn't it, yeah. down the high road? And I, and that high road used to be, I, I'd say, I'm, I'm not trying to dramatise or come all green streets over this because they were terrible, horrible days. Um, but, yeah, I supported Manchester United at the lane and, and somehow found a way back to Seven Sisters Tube a few times. Clive, during your professional career, if I was to say White Hart Lane to you, what what's the first things that you think of? Is it players? Is it walking into that stadium? What what is it? Do you know when I, whenever I'm asked what's your favourite stadium, I, I always say I'm sorry. I judge them by commentary positions, and the commentary position at the lane was terrible. I mean, I, I, the, I, the camera angle never did justice to the stadium because we were always looking. I I always knew when the players were losing their hair before they did. Because my my view was almost I could, might as well have been in the Goodyear blimp above the stadium, looking down from you know somewhere in North London. Um, it, it was just an awful view that we had, and I the old gantry at the lane was just like a pigeon loft. It was full of bird shit, to be honest, uh, and, and a really weird spiral staircase. I, I can see it now, um, sort of looking back. A really weird route we used to have to take over. To get to the position and the new stadium okay i mean it hasn't been crowned by anything wonderful as yet um but it is I, and i always feel when tottenham fans are told what a wonderful stadium they go yeah 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 well what about the team you know and, and, but it is a truly truly wonderful stadium i i mean in european world terms let alone uh british terms and um, yeah, as soon as you fill it with a few trophies in the cabinet, it, it'll be a very, very special place. And it's there on the high road. The White Hart Lane wasn't. White Hart Lane was kind of tucked behind somewhere. Um, and it's, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Bernabeu, if any of your uh, viewers have been lucky enough to go there. It's there on the main, on, you know, on the main thoroughfare. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a wonderful home for Tottenham. I, I, I genuinely feel that. So... Uh, the, the lane will always be the lane, and it's right next door. You, it's not like you've been you know, relocated out to Enfield or somewhere. You, you're still at home, um, still in Tottenham, um, but it is a fantastic, fantastic stadium. Clive, have you been to the new stadium very much? Because from what I understand, you haven't commentated on Spurs so far this season. No, I, I haven't. I, um, I obviously don't get to choose my games. And when I have commentated from the new stadium, it's been from the press box with Talk Sport. Uh, so from the radio position, I haven't done, a, don't think I know I haven't done a television game um, at the Tottenham Stadium uh, as yet. But no, I've, I haven't seen the team in the flesh very often this season. Obviously, I watch the games. Um, what do I think? Um, I think that if I, uh, God forbid, if if Daniel decided to make me the manager tomorrow. I would have the, the if you like, the same issue that the last three or four managers have had, that I've got three outstanding forward players. I still think Harry is, I mean, you know, I hope I hope that the feeling for him hasn't, hasn't been dulled too much by the events of the last 12 months. I really think he is an out, particularly outstanding number nine. And, uh, and he, he can, you know, he's more adaptable than that. He can, he can obviously, I think he could play with somebody in front of him. But um, I think we we almost started to take him for granted, and um, so he's special. Sonny's special. Lucas is a really really good player. So if you've got those three forwards, what do you do? You try to keep the ball out the other end, and that's kind of where Jose Mourinho came in, who's not my favourite individual on the planet. But you know, for a while it sort of worked. While you were a counter attacking team, um, it looked quite promising. Um, and I, 
I, you know, Conte is a different model, but it's it. My first impressions, and they're only my first impressions from a distance, is it's a bit the same that there's a that that you are better as a counter attacking team because of those three forwards, and your best moments this season seem to have been counter attacking moments, and. I think probably to move forward to back to where Poch got, you know, on the verge of winning the Champions League final. And it wasn't a penalty. It really wasn't. And my son's a big Liverpool fan. Um, then I, I, it almost needs a bit of a rethink in, in terms of not becoming as reliant on those three guys scoring the goals that will win games. And the rest of us just trying to keep the opposition out. It's got to be. It wasn't quite in Dombele. It's maybe not quite Lo Celso, but there has to be something else. In, in midfield or maybe wide from the fullback positions that gives Spurs a bit more of an X factor than they've got at the moment. That would be my praise and you can shout me down all you like because I haven't seen a lot of you in the flesh. Do you think Spurs will be successful under Antonio Conte, Clive? Because I don't know whether it was coming across as a little bit of banter. You mentioned trophies. It's my favourite subject because, you know, I desperately want trophies. I go and watch Spurs home and away every single week. And I want to see a trophy because, of course, our last one was 2008. Far too All right, long. Mason got close. <laughs> um, well, I, I, here's a little plug. I mean, I've just got these. Uh, you may be aware we started to market the um, the commentary notes that I do for for all the games, and we kind of poll clubs to ask, you know, what's your iconic match? And if you're whatever Charlton Athletic or Luton Town, it, you know, it, there's probably a choice of one. Spurs, there's almost a choice of none in 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 the recent era, not because there haven't been great games and great moments, and certainly the one that we published there, Amsterdam, was wonderful, but if you're a Tottenham fan, it was whatever it was, three weeks before you lost the final, and so what does it represent? It represents a, a great, great night, which you all celebrated, whether you're in Amsterdam or wherever in the world you were, but, you know, within almost days, um, it, it, you know, the, the the hope that it created had again been doused. And within months, Poch had gone. And I do th everything I've heard about Rizzo Pochettino as a guy, and particularly as a Tottenham manager, Gareth Southgate speaks so highly of him. Um, yeah. You know, the relationship they had when he was in charge at Spurs and Gareth is, is England manager. I don't know. I, I it, it, you, know, you, can't, you can't turn back time. Will Conte be successful? He's been successful everywhere. So probably... I think if I was being really, really outspoken, and I maybe wouldn't say this necessarily to the mail online or whatever, it needs to cheer up a bit. You know, I, I, I'm not quite sure I can buy into him being so surprised and aghast months in that Spurs in his first transfer window, uh, you know, haven't borne the five finest players on the planet and that, you know, you can challenge for the title overnight. That was never going to happen. Um, you know, whatever you think of Daniel, he has not got this club into massive debt. Um, he has actually managed it in, in, in you know, in, in terms of the finances and everything, maybe frustratingly well. Uh, so that was never going to change. I mean, he will invest, he'll buy. And I think that, you know, Ben, ben Tenkur and Kulisevsky, you know, they haven't come for 15 quid a week. I mean, they'll, you know, but they'll be on proper money. And the players that have gone, the players you weren't selecting, not not just Antonio Conte, but the previous manager wasn't selecting yeah. either. So I, 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 there's a bit of I, I, I coming out. And you had enough of that under Jose. It's not about I, it's about we. It's about Tottenham Hotspur moving forward, becoming challengers again. It's not that far to go. You're not 15th. You know, it, it, um, and I think there are other clubs in the traditional big six who are vulnerable at the moment. There are others that are strengthening, certainly. Um, but it's not out of the question uh, that if if you have a good end to the season, you could finish in the top four. It's not out of the question. If West Ham can think about it, you can certainly be thinking about it. So, yeah, I wouldn't say it to his face, but my uh, my whisper in his ear would be, for goodness sake, Antonio, cheer up. You're the Clive, let's, talk, <laughs> let, let's talk about some of the players that you have enjoyed watching over the years playing for Spurs, because in your book, you talk about Glenn Hoddle, and I quote here, Glenn Hoddle was a football magician. Uh, that's not an opinion. That's a fact. Well, the next line is that Glenn knew how he was doing it and magicians know how to do it. And that that's how I define Glenn Hoddle as a magician, because he 
appears one of the most naturally gifted players we'll ever see. Uh, he works so hard on his left foot that he became... There aren't too many genuine two-footed... I think Sonny's a two-footed player, yeah. but a genuinely two-footed player. But he made himself that. He loved having a ball with his feet from an early age. I did a feature on him um, when he was the Chelsea manager for the cup final against Manchester United, player manager. And we actually shot the opening sequence at White Hart Lane. Uh, uh, we, ha we hired a young actor to run out to the field, at, which was kind of, you know, that was his dream uh, to, to play for and to manage Tottenham Hotspur. I went to the old family um, home up the M11 there um, and sat with his parents in the back garden and they talked about him as a child. Glenn made himself a player. Um, and actually, when he went to Monaco, Arsene, one of the things that, Arsene, that struck Arsene Wenger about him was that he could relate how to become better to younger players. He took George Ware under his wing during that period. Now, there are certain wonderful footballers that I've come across in, you know, and privileged to come across during the course of my career who have no idea how they do it. If you ask them, you know, how to bring the ball down in the chest, swivel and turn and volley into the back corner, uh, top corner. They have no idea. Or oh, they can do it, but they can't explain how to do it. Glenn knew how to do it because he made himself that good by trying and trying and failing and trying and trying and failing and trying and succeeding to take it on the chest, swivel and hit it in the top corner. He's a very humble man. I mean, uh, as with all football people, and particularly football managers, he believes in himself. He believes that he knows what is right. But... When you spend time in his company, as I've done in recent years, you know, flying around Europe and the world, getting up at sort of silly o'clock to fly to the next match, um, waiting for a delayed flight, sitting in a traffic jam in, you know, wherever, Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. He is um, he's a genuinely good man. And he frightened me to death two years ago. Um, and uh, I spent a little bit of time uh, with him during his rehab. Um, we had a a few coffees together. John Gorman used to come over and, and we'd sit down and Glenn would just be going for walks, literally 10, 15 minute walks just to try to get his body moving again. And uh, I, I love all the time I spend with him because he is he's a much, much nicer man than me. <laughs> Clive, let's talk about your, your career. Um, how do you prepare for a game? Because I know you're, you know, you, you put these fantastic sheets together uh, available from uh, commentarycharts.com, uh, which people can frame and you will sign them. Um, but all of the facts and, 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 and the pronunciations of players, uh, you keep such high standards. Now, the pronunciation of players, how do you do it? I think it's pronunciation. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, to be honest, anybody watching could do the research that I do. Anybody with neat handwriting could could prepare the charts. If you haven't got neat handwriting, you can do it on a spreadsheet now. Have, you, have you ever lost one during a game? Oh, yeah. I, I've set off to games without them and had to go back. Um, and the pronunciations are what they are. I mean, I, I could waste the next half hour talking about pronunciations because I do anglicise them. I always try to ask players... If I can, you know, I can get face to face with them, which becomes more and more difficult, I'd have to say. Um, but if a player then makes a noise which we don't make in the English language, then I, I would anglicise it. You know, I'm trying to think of a uh, of a Tottenham example. But I mean, um, it, th there's a, a story which I tell in the book about Rude Hullett. Um, and Des Lynham, the great Des Lynham, by the way, talking about great men, you know, to work with him was a fantastic privilege in my life. Um, and uh, in a rehearsal uh, for a World Cup that, that Rude was working on with ITV for, Rude sort of interrupted him and said, it, you might as well call me Gullet because it's it's neither Gullet nor Hullet. And Des said, what is it? And of course, Rude then went this Hullet sound, which only the Dutch make. And so Des said to him, <laughs> excuse my French, it's too fucking late. You scored in a European Championship finalist, Hullet, Hullet you are. And I'd go with that. You know, I mean, we're only identification. We're not linguists. Um, so, you know, once you a, a particular name, I'm sorry, that's it. You're stuck with it. You know, and Andy Cole decided that 
three quarters of the way through his career, his mum wanted him called Andrew. Well, it's too late. You're 200 goals too late as Andy Cole. So, so none of those are actually anything beyond what anybody who really likes their football and wanted to be accommodated could do. Um, the preparation really is how you use that material. It's one thing having it there on a chart. It's another thing. And we've all, you know, we've all done it. it bored our viewers or listeners to death with, you know, what we've researched. So you're bloody well going to hear it. Um, and, and, and actually you turn off, you turn people off, you don't turn them on. So my great mentor in, in broadcasting was Reg Guttridge, the late Reg Guttridge boxing commentator. And he was a journalist and he taught me the editorializing of information, how to use the information, how to present it, how not to talk over the heads of people to, to commentate to my grandma and not to the England manager was one of his, you know, in, include people in the broadcast. If you've got 30 million people watching, which we had for the World Cup semi-final, uh, England uh, uh, against, um, who beat us? Yeah, to Croatia. Um, then include people, you know, don't, don't, don't try to impress people with what you know and have learned. Just talk to, you know, Reg used to say, commentate to white van man, you know, commentate to your grandma. And uh, I, I think if there is a skill in what we do, it is, it's that, it's communication. It's being able to do what the great popular television presenters can do. The the Bradley Walshes, the the Dermot O'Leary's, the Declan Donnellys. Look down that little camera lens and make you and I feel as if oh, I wouldn't mind going for a pint with him. You know, they, he, he seems like a good guy. All, all three of them are really good guys. So that's it. The warmth. My predecessor, Brian Moore, oozed warmth. It took me a long, long time, I think, to develop that, not to be so smart ass and clever and use big words, but just actually to talk to people, but talk to them with the passion that they have for the game and the enjoyment that they have for the game. And that, that if there is a magic in what we do. That is what it is, I think. Clive, we talk about the lack of trophies at Spurs. Now, I was very <laughs> lucky enough to... I was very lucky enough to go to the uh, the Euro 2020 final. Of course, England lost to Italy. You've covered England for years. Um, you know, supporting Spurs is like supporting England as well. And I support both. <laughs> I've gone through the heartache twice over. What is it about England not quite getting over that line? Well, I, I don't let anybody ever, uh, you know, don't let anybody ever tell people like you and I who've seen it with our own eyes that I'm sorry there aren't a, a million Spurs players amongst this list, that Scholes and Gerrard and uh, Lampard and you know Beckham were, were just not as good as we thought they were. They really, really were. I mean, they were Champions League yeah. quality players, top, top level Teddy, top, top Le Shearer, top, top level players. Rooney, actually, for parts of his career. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a raft of defenders. Actually, Cole was probably the best left back in the world for a spell. So it wasn't that. There's something else. There's something else in the, the psyche of that group coming together. And you've got to, you know, ultimately, you've got to put it down to two things, really. One, management. And I think we've got the right guy now. Um, somebody just gets it, gets w what England is about, what the team means to the majority of people uh, who, who like football in our country. And I think probably the second factor is me, us, the media, the, the, you know, the way we came to mistrust everything to do with the England team and almost look to find fault. And, um, and Gareth's gone a long way towards conquering that he's opened the doors a little bit. I think, you know, opened a window and let a bit of fresh air blow in and, um, maybe the modern journalist, um, it's a more diverse profession than it was 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, I think there's perhaps a certain amount of sympathy now and a, a certain amount of love for this group of England players. There are no cliques within the group. You know, they uh, they mix really, really well. Um, and, you know, Gareth would be the first to tell you that we haven't necessarily got the very best players in the world, although, you know, there's a young crop now which provide some hope. But I think there's a better connection between the England national football team and the England football public. And that's actually, it's interesting what you say, because there are a lot of fans, English fans of so-called big six clubs who actually don't really like international football. Rather, it didn't happen. It sort of gets in the way. And you don't have to be um, 
you know, you, you don't have to be a Reese Mogg nationalist to, to, to love the England football team. There's a lot about that end of the spectrum not to love. But it is our team. And when they play in a way that we can be proud of and we can like and identify, then we can be a bit more sympathetic and a bit more forgiving. And I think that's where we are with the England national team. And I think it gives us our best chance that we've had for a little while. Clive, it wasn't long ago, after 22 years of being the senior football commentator for ITV, you were replaced. Uh, on a video, you said it was ITV's decision. You were upset, annoyed and baffled. I love this job. Why, I don't know. I've done nothing wrong. I have not stepped down. Talk us through the moment that you found out that you weren't going to be the, the lead football commentator for ITV anymore. Well, um, I mean, the, the comments that I made were in a video that I put together and just sort of put on my... Twitter feed um, in order to correct a couple of misconceptions about 24 hours after I was told. And um, I mean, it's almost a compliment, but somebody from another program that I was due to work on two, three months ahead, well, it was Soccer Aid, um, contacted me and asked me two big questions. And I was pretty, pretty, you know, brittle at the time. I was quite upset. I hadn't really seen it coming. Um, and I did think that I was still good enough to sort of do the job. Um, but he asked me, I've got to ask you, because you're going to be working on a charity event. Um, is there anything I need to know? Um, are you well? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. I'm, I'm old, but I'm well. And he said, have you done anything? And that that I get a bit of a chill just saying that again. And that's why. I put that little piece of content together just to say, look, uh, you're not going to read about me in three months time that whatever, you know, I ran off with a boss's wife or anything um, uh, or that my legs about to be amputated. You know, it's, it, it was neither of those two things. It was just a decision that was taken and we're all a matter of opinion. And I, I don't agree with the decision. So it, it's, it's difficult to look you in the eye and say, I respect it, but I, yeah, it, the, the person who took it was entitled to take the decision. As it happens, uh, almost in the next breath, he offered me uh, some work as a freelance, um, you know, to carry on, but as number two to Sam Matterface. And it's, I can't pretend that that's an easy, I mean, what's a football analogy? It's like, yeah, buy, buying a new striker and saying, but yeah, here's a new two year contract. Will you stay on in case he gets injured? Well, yeah, you've got to make a living. So on we go. Um, listen, whatever anybody feels about the decision, nobody's about to march on Parliament uh, to try to overturn it. There are Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. Um, there are still people, too many people dying from these this dreadful uh, pandemic around the world that haven't been vaccinated. Um, you know, there are any number of issues. There are uh, power bill rises coming, which some of your viewers you know, just just won't be able to meet. The change of ITV commentators, no big deal. And I'm still working and I'm still happy. Um, but it hurt me at the time because covering England was very, very dear to me. Gareth was at our wedding. You know, Gareth's a mate of ours. And, um, you know, Gareth and Ali are friends of ours. So my, my mate is manager of that team and I'm a supporter of that team and I love commentating on that team. I don't do that anymore, which is a shame. But, um, you know, the Champions League, which was a big part of my career, I now do for American Network. I'm commentating on Premier League for Talk Sport, occasionally for Amazon Prime. Um, I've been working for Rangers Television north of the border during their title year. So I'm busy and I'm happy and say the world carries on turning. And some people will think it's a good decision and some people won't. It's OK. It's cool. Well, we get a lot of support in the uh, in the comments section at the moment, Clive. Everyone's saying it's a dreadful decision. Um, <laughs> now, now I want to talk about um, Bobby Robson. I found this absolutely hilarious in the book. Um, I quote here, I've never known better company and I've never worked with a worse co-commentator. <laughs> Talking about Bobby Robson. Can you can you tell us about this story? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's in the aftermath of the infamous um, Ron Atkinson remark, which um, you know, Ron was great to be around, um, but he, he said what he said. And there's uh, there's quite a lot in the book about that and about racism and there's no defense for it. And he, you know, he had to step down, uh, which he did. Uh, maybe he hadn't stepped down, he'd have been taken down. And so we went into the 2004 European Championship finals uh, without 
a recognized co-commentator. And we had England, France on, I think, the second night. Real headline match was live exclusively on ITV. Brilliant, brilliant game. And so Bobby, who was going to be working for us in the studio, um, was approached and asked whether he would like to be the co-commentator on the England games. And he fenced it. And we had a couple of lunches with him. Brian Barwick, who was my boss at the time, and I, and we explained to him uh, not just the technique, but how important the, the broadcast was to us. And, and he got it. He said, oh, yeah, yeah. It's just like the big games. That I did. This is as important to me as it. Yeah, yeah, fine. And Bobby Robson, when he were in his company, it was just brilliant, brilliant man. Um, never stopped talking football all the time, talking, talking, talking. As soon as the first whistle blew, he shut up. He just <laughs> in the microphone in his hand. I couldn't get a word out of him. And um, uh, we got to the end of the game and, and the end was dramatic. I don't remember England were one up. Uh, Beckham missed a penalty and then Zidane scored twice in the last two minutes. And so it was an extraordinarily dramatic ending. And Bobby still had barely said a word. And as we walked down from the commentary position back towards the area, the sort of holding area down by the big TV trucks you sometimes see outside stadia, Bobby just talked and talked and talked to me. And after about five minutes of walking down the stairs, I turned to a man who I could kiss, just the most lovely man. I said, it's not fucking good now, Bobby. We're off air. And it went a bit quiet then for about five minutes. And then we had a cup of tea and I gave him a big hug. Um, it's just, a, it's a different, it's a performance. Commentary is a performance. Um, and, you know, part of our job as trained broadcasters is to get the best out of, out of our co-commentators. But you can never, rather as you never quite know with a manager whether a great playing career is going to produce a good manager. Some of the best co-commentators I've worked with have had relatively ordinary playing careers, but they just got broadcasting. You know, they they understood how to communicate, what to add, the, 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 the detail that you and I, Chris, will never know of actually having been across the white line down there in the middle, come back and tell the rest of us how and why football matches are won. And Bobby could do that to a dressing room, but he couldn't do it to 20 million television viewers. So I was um, I was in his company about a month before he died. There was, uh, there's, um, used to be, well, it still is actually, uh, the family still run um, uh, a charity golf event in Portugal every year in his name. Um, and uh, he was still smiling away. He was very, very frail by then. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've been truly, truly privileged to have spent time with, you know, Bill Shankly, Brian Clough, um, and the list goes, you know, so, so Bobby would be right up there in terms of Tell, Tell was wonderful. Tell, I, I write about it in the book. Tell was the original uh, um, dinner table tactician. If you had breakfast with Terry Venables, he couldn't help but try to educate you on some aspect of the game without you asking. And uh, I actually uh, wrote in the book there that, that there's nothing more certain that at some stage early in the breakfast, your fork would disappear down the left flank in order to try to engage Cafu and stop him from coming forward. That was how I was. How to, and Terry was fantastic company, argumentative sod, never got away with just saying anything. Terry would always take it up with you. But these guys, I mean, I'm, and I'm not saying these guys don't exist in the game today. They do. You know, there's some wonderful personalities around in football, but the greatest privilege and, and what's the book about? Really, it's about the people I've been lucky enough to meet. Sir Alec, you know, spent time with him. I had the two biggest rollickings of my life off him. And what they and football teach you actually about life, because football is life. So is there anyone that you've worked with um, during your broadcasting career that uh, you didn't like or, or they didn't like <laughs> yes. you? Yes. Next question. <laughs> Fine. Um, no, um, I can only think of one person that I worked, and I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you who he was, uh, who I worked with on co-commentary, and and I spent a few days in his company in World, World Cup, actually, in LA in 1994, and not having him, and I've, nothing that I heard from him since has changed my mind about him. And so it does happen, but equally, um, a, lo a lot of people that I've worked with, as, I still um, give... Pleaty a call every couple of weeks just to see how he is. Lost his wife, you know, relatively recently. And, and that was, you know, it's a big part. Uh, Maureen was a big part of David's life. But Tottenham remains football. He's still down watching your team matches on a Saturday morning. Incredible guy. Um, so a lot of these people that I've worked closely with, Andy Teed, 
you know, uh, Jim Beglin, Glenn and so on, uh, co-commentators have become really, really good friends. And um, shared, you don't just share that 90 minutes with them. As I say, when you're away at a tournament, you share a lot of downtime with them, a lot of traveling time with them, a lot of frustrating time with them in a way. And so um, it, the friendships are very important. And I hope that they are reflected on air. I, I had a good relationship with Ali last summer um, during the Euros. And Ali's, you know, I've known Ali for, uh, I don't know, probably 25 years, something like that. Um, yeah, been drunk with him, listened to him sing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're going to work together again, funny enough, in uh, a few days' time on Everton versus Boreham Wood. Uh, and we're in touch all the time. So these guys, yeah, they 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 become they become close friends. So um, the answer to your question really is one. And he didn't play. Do you, the get, do you get drunk and sing as well? No. Well, I'm, I'm, funny enough, I'm. I, I think quite a lot of commentators were quite. You see it in our notes, really. We're quite contained in Australia. So I love life. I enjoy life. Um, but well, can, can, can I ask? We're pretty, we're pretty good at knowing when that drink has been put in front of us that really will hurt tomorrow. We tend to stop. <laughs> where, where you have to stay professional in in your in your role as a commentator, has there ever been a time where you've got really excited and then you've suddenly thought, actually, I've got to be professional here? I uh, not really. No, 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 no. I think you go. You, it's you've got to go with the flow of the game, and you've got to. Well, you've got to recognise is that the match the next match you commentate on will will be the most important match of the year for somebody watching listening quite a few people watching listening and so it's going to be the really seem like the most important game of the year for you too and so that there is a lot of that's got to go into it uh, which is not difficult when you're privileged to sit in the best seat in the house and watch really really good football matches but it is a, a job. So you're using that more, really. The, and in television, the first thing you've got to recognise as a television commentator is that it's a visual medium. And you're not as important as you are when you're radio commentators. So the picture, yeah, they can, you, you can turn us down. It's not a problem. So you've got to let the, you've got to be led by the pictures. That, that's what's important. You're watching a football match. You don't listen to a football match unless you cannot see it. You don't choose to listen to a match on the radio if you can watch it on a tablet or a television. So the pictures um, lead the way and we've got a, we're, we're just, you know, one of the violinists behind the, the, the main soprano singer or whatever. That's, that's, that's what we are really. We're just, you know, I always say you, there are some great movie soundtracks, but you don't go to a cinema for the soundtrack. You go to see the movie and if the soundtrack's great, then you remember it. And we're just yeah. the soundtrack. Clive, absolutely fascinating book. Now, you put in your book about uh, working for FIFA uh, on the computer games. Recording <laughs> FIFA is the hardest I've ever worked as a broadcaster. <laughs> it is like being in a stormy marriage for a week. Talk us through that. Well, you, um, you, I don't do it now, but um, it used to be like a five-day gig until they got enough of me to record it where, where actually I started to do myself out of work because every year it came around, they could... I only needed two days to record, so I've got less money. Um, but you would have a lot of goal shouts together. And I rewrote the script for FIFA. Um, uh, it's actually um, it's actually made in Vancouver, would you believe? EA make the game in Vancouver. So I inherited a script which had goal miners and goal tenders in it and all sorts of weird Americanisms. So I rewrote the script um, and... I rescheduled the recording so that we didn't do all the goal shouts on one afternoon because obviously it plays havoc with your voice. And actually, if you, when you're playing the game, if you listen carefully, you can hear what stage of the week each, each little part of it was recorded. Um, but when you had a goal session where you were just shouting, you know, the names over and over again, then it, it really, it, I mean, you know, Cowlin, Cowlin, Cowlin! You know, it just became... Re repetitious and um it was i never thought i'd hear you say that <laughs> you came out exhausted as if you've had some terrible row with somebody but um I, i'll tell you a lovely story about fifa it is in the book um which probably turned me on to the reach of the game um my wife and i went on a fabulous uh, Mid middle eastern holiday a, a few years ago uh, and one night we spent out um 
on the canvas um, under the under the stars and this sort of desert environment um, out in uh, where were we? It's called um, Wadi Rum. Um, it's near Petra, and um, uh, these sort of this Bedouin guy in a jeep came to pick us up uh, from the car that we had and to drive us out to this like a moonscape. They, they've actually used this area for a lot of um, kind of sci-fi movies and things. Brilliant, brilliant place to spend a night. Um, and he brought his two kids uh, in the Jeep and the Jeep was pretty noisy and we're, um, we're racing along across the sand dunes to this, this spot where, which where uh, Susan and I are going to spend the night. And the, the kids are sat in the back with her and they're screeching and howling every time I, talk loudly to their dad and uh, he talks to them in whatever it was Arabic and uh, he turned to me and he said they say you sound like the guy from FIFA and I turned around to them and said well very really good afternoon they went ah FIFA 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 <laughs> so two Bedouin kids <laughs> you can't believe it can you Fantastic. in the middle of Jordan um, recognized my voice as the the guy from FIFA well they wouldn't recognize the guy from ITV or talk sport. And that, that is the, the universal language um, of the football as told through the FIFA computer game. <laughs> Clive, last question for you. Um, VAR and match officials. Now, VAR, for you as a commentator, does VAR actually make your job more difficult now? Because do you still go big? Well, we're a bit like the players, really. You celebrate, but you celebrate guarded with guardedly. I'm. I don't want to talk. You, you. Nobody wants to hear what I've got to say about VAR. Anybody they want to hear what anybody, Mike Riley or anybody, is going to say about Are you VAR. A fan? It's one of those. I am a fan of VAR. Um, the problem with it is it's machinery operated by human beings, and so there are going to be mistakes. Can I cut across and mention one human being who is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met, and who I miss every day? Who Tottenham Hotspur signed when everybody thought his career was washed up and finished a great career um uh who's who lived in Broxbourne whose wife V still lives in Broxbourne um you know the likes of Ozzy and Glenn and um uh um Max Max Paul Miller and Graham Roberts were you know around his house and in, in the later later days and I was lucky enough to spend his last full day on the planet uh, with Ray Clements um I promise you, um, you know, keep a place in your heart for your heroes. And, um, you you know, you've got a fantastic choice of, of wonderful, wonderful heroes. Guys that came briefly and were sorcerers with the football and excited you. And then guys who stayed forever, you know, Steve Perriman's of this world and, and were as loyal to the football club as, as you are. But find a place in your heart to always remember Ray Clements who fought cancer for 20 years and it never wiped the smile off his face. Um, we got the, um, the, the, we couldn't go to his funeral for obvious reasons. And, uh, but um, there was a, a sort of order of service with his smiling face on, which has got pride of place in our house. My wife was as devastated as I was when he passed. Um, just a great, great man. And, uh, and um, you, you're lucky to have had um, several great years of Ray Clemens' life at Tottenham. Clive, I think that's your most important call. So um, just tell everyone a little bit about the book, finally. And uh... That's all right. Carry on. Yeah. If, uh, well, Clive, it's um, Clive Tilsley. Not for me, Clive. Clive, uh, good book bookshops. Can you, can you do signed copies Pe online? Paperbacks out in May. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got, to, you've got to pay your electricity bills, so wait for the paperback. <laughs> <laughs> Clive, I can't thank you enough for your time. Honestly, I could sit here all day putting questions to you. So thank you so much for your time. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you very much, Clive. I'll Bye. see you on the next video, everyone. Thanks for watching. Come on, you Spurs. Okay. Bye-bye.